Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good doing good? Good to see you. Appreciate you coming out once again. And look forward to getting into God's Word tonight and continuing on here with our Wednesday evening series. All right, so let's uh, take God's Word together. Let's go to Isaiah 42. Start with Isaiah 42, and you may also want to go ahead and find Zechariah chapter 3. Isaiah 42 and Zechariah chapter 3. We are considering the Gospels right now, and uh, we're starting to get into what we're calling the fourth installment of the fifth course of punishment, as we talked about last week. And um, we'll get to the Gospels here in just a few minutes, but we're revisiting the the prophets very briefly as we as we look at these things to try to develop the big picture role and function of the gospels and the prophetic function that they serve as it relates to god's program with israel and um, of course the prophets as we have looked at in weeks past had commanded the nation of israel that when messiah comes that they were to behold him mm -hmm. and they were to behold him in four particular ways and they had actually commanded Israel to behold them that way. And uh, we're learning that the Gospels um, have a connection to that. And each one of the Gospels have a, um, uh, a unique emphasis. Right? They, they cover a lot of things, but a unique emphasis of presenting Jesus of Nazareth to Israel as their Christ and showing, them, uh, showing him to the nation in those four ways that the prophets had told them and instructed them to behold him. And so we're... Looking at that and um, looking at the, the, the doctrinal function of the Gospels here as we try to get a big picture role of that. You know, the Gospels, um, of course, the life and ministry of the Lord is talked about in the Gospels. Most people that are familiar with the Scriptures at all understand that the life of Jesus is covered, for the most part, by the Gospels as far as the, the, the human being, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, but did you know that the Gospels is not given with the intent of being a biography of the life of Jesus? Right? The Gospels are not a biography of Jesus of Nazareth. That's not their intent. Uh, rather, the intent is to present Jesus as Israel's Messiah. Yes, sir. Right? To cause the nation to behold him in these prophetic ways. And that's why there's... Parts of his life where the Gospels don't really touch on it much. There's not a lot of detail on it. You know, you'll have some things about his birth. You have, uh, I think, just a single instance of about a, a time when he was 12 years old. And then the most part, you know, he's 30 years old and on to about 33, 33 and a half years there where he's crucified and buried and resurrected. Uh, but the majority of the Gospels really deal with just a few years of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the intent of the Gospels is not to give you a biography. And to give you a lot of interesting facts about the life of Jesus, right? There's a, there's a specific prophetic objective that they're looking to accomplish, and that aligns with the prophets. And beholding Jesus as the Messiah, according to the ways that the prophets had declared. And so the prophets had said that when Messiah comes, that Israel needed to behold him in these four ways. They needed to behold him as the king, as the servant of Jehovah, as the perfect man, and the God fellow, or God manifest in the flesh that's who he is and the gospels have as their emphasis those four things king servant man and god and so we're seeing that the gospels correspond to those four things and they have a, a particular one of those that they're emphasizing and we got underway with that last week with a look at matthew and we beheld the king Amen. along with the nation israel and so we're ready to now move on to the next thing, which is beholding the servant. And we'll do that in the Gospel of Mark, which we'll get to here in just a minute. But before we behold the servant in Mark's account, I wanted to bring you back here quickly to the prophets and just show you these behold statements that correspond to the overall emphasis of the Gospel of Mark that we're going to be looking at. And so we start here in Isaiah 42, verse number 1 is our behold statement. The Lord through the prophet says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold. Mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Right, so you've got the statement there. The Lord commanding Israel through the prophets, Behold my servant. Speaking of the Messiah there. Uh, you're in Isaiah. Look at chapter 52, if you will. Similar statement. In Isaiah 52 and verse 13. The Lord through the prophet again says, Behold my servant. 
shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Behold my servant. All right. And then Zechariah is the other prophetic witness, chapter 3. And we see the connection of the servant to the concept of the branch that we've studied in weeks past. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Yes, sir. Behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. And so the collective testimony of the prophets is commanding Israel here before Messiah ever comes, that when he comes, you need to behold my servant. Right? The Messiah is going to be functioning as a servant to accomplish the objective of the Lord. All right? So the command is to behold Messiah as the servant of Jehovah. And so with that prophetic base, we move on to the Gospel of Mark now. And Mark chapter number 1 is where we're going to begin. And we're going to start here at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark concerning the servanthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark in his gospel, has as the aim, making this presentation of Israel, of Jesus of Nazareth, as the Christ, the servant of the Lord. Now, with the aim of presenting Christ as the servant, it would be no surprise that as Mark begins his gospel, he quickly begins diving into issues of Christ's ministry without giving a whole lot and actually any detail at all as it relates to his conception and birth. Right? That would be different if you were just reading the Gospels, as they're laid out in the Bible from start to end, if you'd come through Matthew already, you would have seen that there was some chapters there early on that were devoted to some events surrounding the, the birth and the early years of Christ. And it'll talk about the, uh, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ we looked at last week. It'll talk about his conception in a virgin's womb and some other details around those things that took place when he was born. But Mark passes over that completely and does not spend any time at all dealing with the conception or the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets almost straight into the ministry of the Lord that takes place when he's about 30 years of age. And as you read down through chapter 1 here, you're going to find that he will quickly start with an uh, abbreviated description of the ministry of the forerunner, John the Baptist, and he will quickly sprint on to the, uh, the baptism of the Lord and the temptation of the Lord in the wilderness before he begins his ministry when he's about 30 years of age. And then he'll land upon Christ's first Galilean ministry by the time you're at chapter 1, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Right? So 30 years of time, really, that we're talking about have been passed over by Mark with virtually no mention of any details concerning those things. He's, he's, he's hustling, as it were, straight to the work and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're there by the time you get into verse 14 here of chapter 1. And so we want to look at that, and I want you to notice that as Mark is off and running, beginning at verse 14, accounting the ministry and the service of Christ, how the, the, the pace at which Mark's gospel starts is just kind of snap, 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 one thing to the next. He's not going to linger, he's not going to give you a lot of details, he's going to show you Jesus conducting ministry, doing one thing after another in rapid succession. Okay, It's a very fast-paced gospel and, and events are just stacked on top of one another and you'll see the lord jesus christ doing a lot of things he's going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom mm -hmm. to the people in israel there and he'll go and he'll he'll perform miracles mm -hmm. he'll cast out devils and then he'll he'll uh you know he, he calls some disciples here in chapter one as well that he's he's moving on to another city where he's preaching again he's performing miracles cleansing lepers and that type of thing and it's just one thing after another through chapter one as mark is beginning to sprint in uh, communicating the, 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 the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ here, which is, of course, in keeping with the theme that he's wanting to present. And we're going to see that. And so we'll pick up with the reading here in verse 14. And I just want to read down through a number of these verses to kind of give you a, a sampling of, of what I'm describing here and the way that he accounts this at the very beginning, early on here in the Gospel of Mark. And so beginning at verse 14 now, he says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. All right, so Christ is beginning his ministry and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom here. All right, so he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And now in verse 16, he's going to begin calling disciples unto himself. Verse 16, he says, Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. 
And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Right, so he's got some followers coming after him now as he's going about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then in verse 21, you're going to see him beginning to go into their synagogues. And he says, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So he's casting out devils, right? A sign of that kingdom that he's preaching. And verse 28 says, And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. There's a guy over here that's preaching and casting out devils. And his fame begins to spread there in the land. Verse 29, he says, And forthwith they went, or they, uh, excuse me, forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. And then on they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. Right out of the synagogue into a healing here of the fever. Verse 32, And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Amen. And you can go on and you can read down through the end of the chapter there, verse 45. But hopefully what you can see as you're reading through that is that, you know, the ministry and the service and the work of this Jesus of Nazareth is what Mark is holding up at the forefront, right? It's just one thing after another as you see Jesus beginning the ministry and going about doing all these different things. And in rapid succession, Mark is just listing off all these things that Jesus is doing here. And why do you suppose that Mark would be beginning his gospel in that rapid ministry type of emphasis? Right, he's causing the nation to behold the servant, just as the prophets had, had said that they would and should. And we want to talk a little bit about that here from uh, Mark chapter number 1 as our emphasis. Of course, the whole gospel is emphasizing this issue of beholding the servant. But as we said last week, the beginning and the ending of each one of these gospels specifically and, and pretty powerfully put forth the main issue that the gospel is concerned with. We saw that with Matthew last week. And the opening and closing passage is emphasizing the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here in Mark, that same thing's true. Mark is starting off his gospel with an emphasis of the servant by showing us his ministry. And the things that he's, he's conducting and doing here as his kingdom ministry gets underway. Now, one of the first notable points about Mark and his account, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that there is no genealogy of Christ that's given. Okay, He's, he's straight to the ministry of the Lord. Now, the reason for that is because Mark is not seeking to necessarily tie Jesus to the covenants in the same way that we saw Matthew doing it. Obviously, Jesus has relationship to the covenants. We're not invalidating that or saying that's not an important issue. That is an important issue. And we talked about that last week, and it has its place in the, the prophetic presentation of Christ. But Mark's emphasis as the one who's causing the nation to behold the servant, and Jesus as the servant... It's not concerned with presenting details about the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is because the genealogy of a servant, of a servant is practically unimportant. Right? It really doesn't matter where he comes from. It doesn't matter who his mama and his daddy is when you're considering the servant. What you want to know about a servant is whether or not he can get the job done. Right? I don't care who your mama is. I don't care who your daddy is. My concern is can you do the job? 
right? What, what are you capable of doing? What, what abilities do you have? What kind of skill set equip you to accomplish a specific work? What kind of service can you perform? And so the genealogy of Christ, when it comes to beholding him as a servant, is practically unimportant to Mark's purpose. What we want to know is, can the servant that he's showing us effectively get his job done? What kind of work is he capable of accomplishing? And so that's really the evaluation of the servant. That's the mindset that the Holy Spirit is having Mark write in, right? We're evaluating Jesus as a servant here. And so we're not so concerned about his supernatural origin. We're not so concerned about his conception in a virgin's womb, though all that's true and all of that's important in showing the servant. Mark just wants them to see what he does as a servant. What kind of work is he capable of performing? And so he's getting right to that task as he's opened up his first chapter here. Now along those lines also, I think it's worth pointing out that in Mark's gospel, you have far more miracles of the Lord recorded than you have in any other gospel. Do you know that? More miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry are recorded by Mark in his gospel than you find in Matthew, Luke, or John. Right, he's a doer, yeah. He's emphasizing the servanthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's running through these miracles and lists off far more than any of the other gospel writers. More miracles in Mark than any of, the, any of the other gospels. And not only is that the case as far as the quantity of the miracles that Mark records, but Mark records the greatest quantity of miracles while at the same time containing his gospel and, and causing it to be the shortest of the four. The other Gospels are longer in their length, in the, the words that they use, in the descriptions of things that they use. Mark's the shortest of the Gospel, and, and yet it's the one that records the most miracles. A lot of work gets accomplished by the Lord in Mark, and it gets accomplished, therefore, very efficiently. A lot done in a short amount of time. That's efficient work, you see. Not just working. Now, you can work hard and work on and on and on and never get anything really accomplished, but He's presenting a servant who not only can work, but is efficient in that work. He's able to get a whole lot done in a very short amount of time. That's a true description of the Lord, is it not? Able to do a whole lot in a short amount of time. Why is that important to Mark's purpose? Because he wants him to behold the servant. Behold how he goes about and does his ministry. Behold how he fulfills the good pleasure of the Lord. And he does so with haste. In fact, I think you can see that Christ's service in that fashion, the efficiency and the haste to which he attends upon it and his faithfulness to it, it's highlighted by the way that Mark describes it in the words that he uses. You'll see as you go down through here in chapter 1 especially, but really all through the Gospel of Mark, you're going to see these action words that the Holy Spirit has Mark select to describe the ministry and, and the work of the Lord. You'll see these words like the word immediately coming up. Right? He, go, he does something that immediately Something happens. You'll see the word straightway. Yeah. Right, right away took place. You'll see words like forthwith. And, and add-on is another word that the Bible uses to describe the work of the Lord. You can see it here all through chapter 1. You, you trace it throughout God, the, the gospel of Mark. If my count's correct, those words get used over 40 times in Mark's gospel. At least 40 times. And that's interesting when you compare the number of times that those words get used in the rest of what we typically call the New Testament, you know, it, it, it pales in comparison. Mark uses those words more than the rest of the so-called New Testament in this short little book of 16 chapters. Yeah, right. Immediately, straightway, forthwith, and on, just about every time you turn around. If you, if you read Mark's gospel and you're, you're keeping up with those words and just seeing the pace of it, about where you out to read it, trying to keep up with the Lord when you're going through Mark. He's busy about his work. He's, he's, he's doing it with haste. You see those words here? You, like, you go back up to chapter 10, uh, verse 10 right here of chapter 1, for example. And straightway, coming up out of the water. Verse 12, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Verse uh, 20, and straightway he called unto them. Verse 21, they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. Verse 28, and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region. Verse 29, and forthwith they were come out of the synagogue. Verse 30, 
End of the verse. And Anon, they tell him of her. Verse 31, end of the verse again. And immediately the fever left her. Right? Verse 42, he does it again. He says, and as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he was cleansed and straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. There's an abundance of these words showing up here in the very first chapter, setting the tone for what's going to be coming after this in his gospel. When he uses these words over and over and over again to show that the Lord is doing his business with haste as the servant of the Lord. Behold Christ as the servant. Amen. Behold the servant. Now, if you jump over to the end of Mark's gospel now, we're going to survey this one the same way we did last week with Matthew, looking at the opening and closing passage. He sets the tone for Christ the servant right there off the bat in chapter 1. He continues to build upon that throughout the book, and then you come over here to chapter 16 at the end, and I think that you're going to find that this gospel closes also with another powerful illustration of the servanthood of the Lord as Mark is presenting Christ as the servant according to that prophetic witness. We're interested in Mark 16 and verse 15 to the end of the chapter. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants, uh, serpents, excuse me. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they sh shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. All right, so you've got another description here to close out the gospel where he's giving them a commission to go forth and preach. Amen. Right? We looked at a, a similar type of thing there at the end of Matthew with the commissioning of the disciples there. And, of course, we understand at this point that we're talking about Israel's program. Right? This series is called Israel's My Glory. I hope we understand that at this point. We're talking about Israel. Mark's witness to Israel is about showing Israel the servant, Messiah the servant, and the, the gospel that's being talked about, and, and you would know this at this point in Mark, if you're reading it through, the gospel that they're talking about here in the gospel of Mark is the gospel of the kingdom. Amen. Right? That's what Jesus came preaching there in Galilee that we read in chapter uh, number one. The kingdom's at hand. Repent and believe the gospel of that kingdom. Right? The time's fulfilled. It's, it's right on the doorstep. It's what prophecy said. And they're there at it. He, he's been preaching that gospel. And the, the gospel of the kingdom of God is the issue. That, that's the context of which Mark's talking about here. And that's, of course, why the signs that are associated with that are following in connection with what he says here. Yes, sir. Right? He's going through a list of signs that are associated with gospel, the gospel and things that attend belief in that gospel. There's some signs that follow that, he says. Yeah, the Jews he says. require a sign. Yeah, and the Jews require a sign. These are things of Israel's program. And if you understand... Some of these issues that Mark's dealt with that are set forth by the prophets, you would understand why those signs follow the gospel that they're preaching, right? Because what they're anticipating is not the coming of a dispensation of the grace of God and, you know, 2,000 plus years of time where the body of Christ is going to be going. That, that's all a mystery at this point. They know nothing about that. Christ in his earthly ministry has said nothing about that. They've never heard of anything like that before because God has not revealed it yet. All they know is what's been made known to them according to prophecy and the ministry of the Lord as the, circum, uh, the minister of the circumcision in his flesh, what he had taught them and what he had operated in connection with in his ministry concerning the gospel of the kingdom. They're anticipating that the Lord is going to be going away. They're about to embark upon a ministry of offering repentance to Israel giving them an opportunity to change their mind about Jesus of Nazareth, who they just recently crucified and rejected. And then at some point they understand that after that offer, that there's going to be coming a, a day of wrath out here, that they're going to be in, having to endure under the end of that thing, and then Christ is going to return to establish the kingdom. That is what they're anticipating here. They understand the ministry that they're going to be conducting. And so... That, that's the context. That's what the signs pertain to. And if you understand that's where they're at in their mind, those signs there are necessary in view of what's going to be happening out there. 
A lot of what he's talking about here is, is descriptions of various physical salvations that they're going to need. When it comes to the issue of, uh, you know, uh, casting, out, casting out of devils that are going to be operational at that time. When it comes to speaking with new tongues, right? They're out there among nations that have all these different languages operating. That's necessary for them. Physical salvations that are promised to them as they're obedient to the Lord Amen. and do what he says and follow his commandments. Taking up of serpents, right? The judgment of God's going to be going on out there. And these serpents that are poisonous or deadly things when the water is poisoned by wormwood and that type of thing. All of those judgments out here, things they're going to need physical salvations from. There's reasons why those signs follow this gospel that they're talking about. Amen. See? These are all Israel program issues. And there, there's a lot to that. We've not talked about a lot of those things in detail at this point. So I don't expect you to fully comprehend what I'm saying there. But I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying in order to have you to realize that we're talking about things here in Mark 16 that are specific to Israel's program. That fit right in there with what prophecy had said and what they were expecting according to prophecy. And these are kingdom issues and doctrines that pertain to the gospel of the kingdom and Israel's program and those types of things. And so in that kingdom context, Mark is going to highlight the issue of the servant once again here at the end of the book. As they're going out to conduct this ministry to Israel and a view of what's coming in the program, you notice in verse 19 there, he says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. Now he's ascending back to the Father as he told them that he would. And then verse 20, they're going to go and they're going to perform this ministry, offering repentance to Israel here. It says, And they went forth and preached everywhere. Then it says the Lord, the Lord does something as they're conducting that ministry, right? Early in the book of Acts there, as they're going forth and they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom and, and the things associated with that, it says that the Lord was doing what? Working with, working with them yeah. and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Amen. The Lord was working with them. Now he's, he's just said in the previous verse, he's ascended back to the right hand of God. He's gone back to heaven and he sat down there. But yet as they go forth to conduct this ministry that he's given them, Mark is, is careful to point out the fact that even though he's there at the right hand of the Father, the Lord is working with them and he's the one confirming the signs following. Wow. The Lord's working. Now why is he talking about the Lord working? What's his emphasis? Behold the servant. What's a servant do? He works. Right? He works. Yeah. And Mark closes out his gospel with another strong presentation of Christ after he's been here on the earth. He's gone back to heaven. They're fulfilling that ministry in relation to prophecy. The Lord's working with them. Working. Behold the servant. Yes, Behold the servant. And so we see in Mark's opening and closing passage the specific emphasis of his gospel being put forth here. Absolutely. Amen. Behold the servant. Amen. All right. We're going to move over to Luke now. We're going to behold the man. Okay. And we're going to be in Luke chapter one. But before we do that, I want to go back to Zechariah real quick. Grab the verse for you. Zechariah chapter six. The prophetic command to behold Christ as the man. The perfect man. And again, we have the association to the branch, the branch here. Zechariah 6 and verse 12. He says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And so Zechariah commands the nation, Behold the man, the branch, the man. All right, so that is the particular testimony of the Gospel of Luke. All right, so we've beheld the king in Matthew we beheld the, the servant in Mark, and now we're ready to behold the man. And that's given to Luke, and he records that here in his gospel. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to open up here with the first four verses. Luke 1, verse 1. He says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses, and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very beginning, 
or from the very first, excuse me, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now here in the opening of Luke's gospel and in pursuit of causing Israel to behold Christ as the man, we notice right off the bat that Luke addresses his gospel to a specific person named Theophilus. He's writing to Theophilus about these things that have been, uh, he's been instructed in concerning the earthly ministry of the Lord. And he, uh, Luke, having perfect understanding of these things, as he says, thought it right to set in order those things. And he addresses this gospel to one Theophilus. Now the name Theophilus, by the way, means lover of God. Right, that's what the name means. Lover of God. Now it's my understanding that Luke is probably addressing this to a specific individual that goes by that name. Right, there's probably one that's uh, alive there at the time when he's writing it, a specific individual that went by that name that he's addressing this to. But beyond that, I also think that the Holy Ghost uses that individual as a, a greater representation that's meant to be instructed for the nation of Israel in order to bring the focus of Luke's main theme to the forefront of their thinking. Mm -hmm. And I say that because when you think about the meaning of that name Theophilus, uh, that means lover of God, you think about that in the greater context of Israel's program, what was it that Israel as a nation was called to be in the midst of the Gentiles? Well, those Gentiles were idol worshipers. They were followers of the adversary's plan, and God had called out Abram and created a nation from his seed for a specific purpose that Israel would be different from those nations. That they would not go after those vanities of the adversaries, but they alone would have the oracles of God and the light of God in the midst of the earth. And they as a nation would truly be a Theophilus nation. They would be lovers of the one true and living God. That's what they were to be. You think about uh, the way it says it in the law, Moses writing there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. The nation was commanded to love God, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Israel was supposed to be lovers of God. Israel's the nation that was vested with the purpose of God in the earth. Right? The purpose that God started out with at the very beginning of the creation of the world, that was vested in the nation of Israel. They were to be a prince with God, a ruler with God. That's what Israel means, by the way. Remember when Jacob's name was changed, he was given the name Israel? For as a prince, thou shalt have power with God. They're to reign with the Lord in the kingdom. That, that purpose of God for this earth was vested in the nation Israel. And their name bears that out. And the kingdom purpose that was given to Israel, and that God promised to Israel, that was really just an extension of what God had purposed for mankind from the very beginning when he created Adam as a man. All right, back here. Created the earth. Created the first man, Adam, and placed him on it. Mm-hmm. For the purpose of what? Being God's monarch. Gave him dominion. Told him to subdue the earth. He's to function as a king. Mankind was created to really be rulers with God on this earth and to fulfill the purpose of God. And, and with that came a certain responsibility to be lovers of God in connection with that purpose. To love God by fulfilling his will in a kingdom on this earth and ruling on behalf of God in connection with that. It was a responsibility to be a lover of God that was true of man and his creation. True of mankind in general. And ultimately of Israel in particular. It's the things that take place there. And finally that purpose is vested in the nation. It was man loving God by fulfilling his will and seeing his kingdom work accomplished on the earth. There's a responsibility for man in that. A responsibility for Israel in particular as God's men to love him with all their heart, soul, and might, as Deuteronomy 6, 5 commanded them. You know, the Lord himself, in his ministry, he'll say of that commandment there from Deuteronomy that it's the greatest commandment. Hmm. The first and greatest commandment 
in the law that was given to Israel. He says it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That's the first commandment. The first and great commandment. Of course, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says that all the law and the prophets hang on these two. But the greatest is to love God with all your being. Now, Israel was called upon to be the Theophilus nation, the lovers of God in the midst of the earth. And if that's the greatest commandment that Israel was given, as stated by the Lord, then I would say that that was also Israel's greatest responsibility, wasn't it? If it's the greatest command, that's your greatest responsibility. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Be a Theophilus nation. You know, biblical love is really nothing like the definitions that most of us have in our thinking that we got from the world. People think of love and they think of, you know, this emotional type of nonsense. But biblical love is not really described that way. When you, when you start looking at the way the Bible describes love, it, it has more to do with the fulfillment of God-given responsibilities toward God and toward others. Fulfillment of responsibilities. You know, in the Bible, love is not synonymous with like. We say that sometimes kind of flippantly. Oh, well, I, I love whatever it is. I love my car. I love this particular dish. Well, what, what do you mean? You don't love it. You like it. Right? You know, God never commanded Israel to like him. He never commanded Israel to like his word. But he did command them, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There, there's a fulfillment, right, of a, of a responsibility toward God. You're my people. You're my people and I'm your God and we're in covenant. We've got responsibility here. Fulfill your covenant. Uh, fulfill your responsibility. In other words, to love the Lord. Be faithful. The Lord had said this, and, and when he said the greatest commandment, you know, he's speaking there specifically of the national, the national issue as it relates to Israel. But even the, the preacher of Ecclesiastes says that to fear God and keep his commandments is the whole duty of man. It's the duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments. To fulfill responsibility toward God is the duty of man. Man and his creation has the duty to be a Theophilus or a lover of God. And the truth of the matter is, all men have failed at that, haven't they? Israel failed at that as a nation. There's been no man from Adam forward, according to the flesh line of Adam, that has been truly a Theophilus and a perfect lover of God. We've all failed in that respect. We love ourselves more than we love God. All right, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that have that perfect devotion to the Lord and has been a true Theophilus as a lover of God. All men have failed at that. And that's especially significant here in this Gospel of Luke wherein we find a witness to Christ as the man who's going to go forth and perfectly fulfill all of man's duty as a lover of God. You know, Jesus Christ is really the only true lover of God that has ever lived among men. The only one who ever truly loved God in the true sense of the word was perfectly devoted to all the commandments of the Lord. Never failed, never went back from the words of his mouth, but perfectly committed to the Father's will. Jesus Christ is really the only true lover of God. The only true Theophilus. And therefore, because that's true, what Israel needs to do is they need to behold that man. Because finally they're going to be able to behold a man that goes forth and does what man was created to do. In perfect allegiance to the Father, in perfect accomplishment of his work, and he's going to fulfill all that man was created to be from the very beginning. And that's really the first insight you get in Luke's gospel here where the human emphasis of the Lord is going to be emphasized. You see that further illustrated by the fact that the Holy Ghost specifically will, will have Luke point the, to the fact that he has perfect understanding of these things. Hmm. Luke has perfect understanding of these things, he says. And that's, 
That's not only true because of the inspiration of God by which he's writing the scripture, but it's also true by virtue of the fact that he has received the information that he's recording here from those men, as he says in verse 2, from the beginning were eyewitnesses. There were some men that were able to verify the things in Luke's account because they were there and they saw it with their own eyes. They saw Jesus going about and doing these things that Luke's going to be writing about. Eyewitnesses. You know, eyewitness accounts are chiefly a characteristic of human verification. Eyewitness testimony. It's not the only way to gain knowledge or know things, but that is a primary way in which we interact and communicate. Right? We talk about it, and people use the phrase sometimes, I saw it with my own eyes. I'm able to verify it because I saw it. It's a means of, of human verification. And Luke says in his gospel that to the measure possible, it's verified by eyewitness testimony. It's perfectly inspired of God so that you don't have to rely just on what men saw. But nevertheless, these events that Luke is writing about have been verified by men because they saw it. He's authenticating it Amen. with human testimony, what God said in his record. Amen. And so the Holy Ghost is careful to make that point here at the beginning. He's, he's cluing us into the emphasis of the fact that Jesus Christ, that this, is, this is verified humanity that he has. Amen. Right? He's verified in his humanity as you look at him as the man. Luke will go on here and you'll see the particular human emphasis that he gives leading on from this as he talks about and gives details of uh, the, the birth of John and the, the human emotional side of what uh, the coming of a child means to Zechariah and Elizabeth, his mother. It'll talk about the emotions of Mary in connection with the news from the angel that she's going to be uh, the mother of the Christ child. And he'll go on here and he'll talk about um, running the, the genealogy of the Lord all the way back. Yes, through David and through Abraham, as Matthew did, but all the way back to Adam, the first man. This is verified humanity. Why is he doing that? Because Israel needs to behold the man. This is a real man that we're talking about in Jesus of Nazareth. Luke's gospel emphasizes that here in the opening chapters. And there's a lot of details you can look at in connection with that, but his emphasis is the man as he starts his gospel. Now let's go over to the end of the book. I'm going to use the closing passage of this one as well here. See another emphasis of his humanity. And in this case, I'm interested in verses 50 to 53. Luke 24, 50. It says that he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, there's a couple of things here about the humanity of the Lord that I would like to point out. The first one is that as he is here with his disciples at the end, we see that Jesus is said to lift up his hands to bless the disciples. He said that there in um, verse 50. He led them out as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Hands are predominantly a human characteristic, aren't they? Now, there's other creatures in the Bible that are described as having hands, obviously. God is spoken of as having hands hands and so forth and that type of thing. But predominantly, I'd say that hands is a description of a human feature. And that's especially true when those hands are being lifted up, right? Men lift up hands. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 8, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Men lift up hands, you see. And that's somewhat what we have the Lord doing here as he's with his disciples. He's lifting up his hands as a man, a verifiable human being there in their midst, lifting up his hands in order to bless them. These are hands, I'll remind you, that at this stage in the gospel are hands that have been pierced 
just a few days prior when he was crucified. He's lifting up nail-scarred hands, isn't he? Hands that have received the nails as he was being hung on the cross there. He's died. He's been buried at this point. He's resurrected and he's among his disciples at this point and he's lifting up those hands that have been pierced. He's got the scars. He's got the piercings through his hands there. And he's lifting those hands up. You know, in John 20, 27, those pierced hands are part of the evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ offered to them when he appeared to them after the resurrection to verify the fact that it was he himself, right? This, this is not a, a spirit that they're seeing. This is a verifiable human body that's in their midst. And he'll tell them, he'll say, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Yeah. This is, this is a, a man that's standing there, right? Verifiable. You're able to touch him. You can't do that with a spirit. Yeah. Yeah, this is a human being that's resurrected and standing in their midst. Touch my hands and see. Verify it. And those hands as a primary and predominant feature of, of humanity, able to be touched and seen for the piercings that they have, are now being held up as he blesses his disciples before he returns back to the Father. Luke calls out that detail. Why? Because verification of his humanity. Behold the man. He's a man. One other thing about that, I, there's other details of this, but another feature I think that highlights the humanity of Christ here is in verse 51. It says, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Right? That verse is describing his ascension back to the Father, obviously. But you notice the way that the, the Holy Ghost has Luke describe this there. He describes, the, you know, he describes the ascension as him being carried up. It, he doesn't say that he was parted from them and ascended into heaven. Now, obviously, that's what's happening. He is ascending. But he doesn't describe it that way hmm. to you there in the Bible. He says he was carried up into heaven. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, you just think about what's happening here. I mean, we're talking about a verified human being who's going up. And that leaving the earth and going up into heaven. Is that natural for a human being to do? No. You see any people just floating up into the air recently? Yeah. No. Lazarus was another that was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. Yeah. The rich man also died. He was buried in the earth of his eyes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a normal thing for men to go to heaven. All right, go up into heaven. Men were created to dwell on the earth. God created Adam and he put him on the earth. He didn't create him and put him in heaven. He created him and put him on the earth. Why? The Lord gave the earth for man to dwell on. That's where men belong. That's what God created them for. Dwelling on the earth. And so for a man to go up into heaven is really a very unnatural thing. Man was created from the dust of the earth. Right? He's made from the earth. He dwells upon the earth, given dominion on the earth, precisely because God created him for a purpose that's earthly in nature. Man's an earthly creature. Psalm 115, verse 16 says that the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. God's purpose for man and his original creation was for the earth. All the scriptures in Israel's program relate to an earthly kingdom in which the righteous will be resurrected to live in forever. Not in heaven, but on earth. Now, we talk about it today in the, you know, the body of Christ, our terminology. We think of verses from the Apostle Paul that talk about our conversation is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? We're going to be caught up. To meet the Lord in the air. And he talks about the heavenly places. And so for us to conceive of that, right, we think about the eternal state, if you will, as the body of Christ. We it's not uncommon for us to talk about going to heaven. Amen. But you realize that's a concept that they have never heard of? They don't know anything about that. They're, they're not looking to die and go to heaven. Amen. They're expecting a kingdom to come, right, to the earth. That's what prophecy had been talking about. That's what the prophets had been saying since the world began was coming. 
Like man's not going up there with God. God's coming down here with us. You see, that's what the kingdom was about. Men belong on the earth. And so it's unnatural for men to go up to heaven. And it's so unnatural until Paul say, you know, the Lord had to form a new creature, uh, one new man, in order to go up into heavenly places. Because that's not where man naturally belongs, according to what God did back there with Adam. It's unnatural for men to go to heaven. And yet you have Jesus here, a verifiable man in their midst, going up into heaven. Very unnatural thing. Men don't do that. They don't have the power to do that as humans. If a man's going to get up there, how is he going to have to get there? The power of God's going to have to carry him up. I'm not discounting his deity. I know this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God manifest in the flesh. He's got the power to do what he wants. But in, the, in his flesh, he is a real living man. And a man has to be carried up to go into heaven. He's emphasizing the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Fits the theme. Causing Israel to behold him as the man. Yeah, he's the king. Yeah, he's the servant. Yes, he's God in the flesh. But he's a real man. He's a real man. And Luke in his gospel has that as his emphasis all through the gospel. But there at the beginning at the end, once again, you see the emphasis of his theme, behold the man. Hmm. All this lines back up with what the prophets had told Israel to behold, and that's the presentation of Christ that they're giving. So we beheld the king in Matthew, beheld the servant in Mark, we beheld the man in Luke. That leaves one more. And we're going to behold God there in John next time. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for your attention tonight. We'll stop there in closing prayer. Our God and Father, we're grateful for the word. We thank you for these truths that we can observe in the Gospels and the precision with which you put them together and the, uh, the unified message that it gives, but yet the specific message that it gives. We give you thanks for these things, and we pray that as we continue to, to look at one further witness of the Christ and his earthly ministry and the Gospel of John, and we behold him as God next time, that... Uh, we would just be able to put all these things together and see this fourfold presentation of your son that was given to the nation of Israel and along with them, behold him and who he is in his person. We thank you for these saints and their desire for, to hear the word and to study and uh, to come together to um, participate with us as we look through your word. Pray that these things will be a uh, service and the furtherance of their edification and we'll give you the thanks and praise for it in Christ's name.